Hello people, how are you doing? Welcome, my name is Adam, this is Memento Mori. I hope you're all doing well. Uh, today we are doing the Casual 10 tag, okay? Uh, this was created uh, by Sean the Book Maniac, okay? Fantastic channel, I'll link them down below. And Sean originally called this, I think, something like the take 10 books off your shelf uh, and talk about them tag. Uh, but then Steve Donahue, of course, uh, took it and changed it, thinking that the name was a little too long, uh, which it probably is. Uh, and he changed it to something called the um, grab and gab tag, uh, which I don't like at all. I'm sorry, Steve. Uh, the word gab, I, I just, I don't like it. It's a little bit matronly, uh, and it, it doesn't quite fit the aesthetic that I, I'm going for here on Memento Mori. Grab and gab sounds like something you do with your girlfriends when you all go like candle shopping. Uh, I'm not too into it. Uh, so I've changed it yet again to uh, the casual 10 tag, all to emphasize the casual side of Memento Mori, okay? And uh, that's a long introduction for a very simple tag. I really like it. Uh, the whole idea is to Take 10 books off your shelves. Uh, a few of these that I'm going to mention I don't actually have on my shelves, but uh, just to, to take 10 books and to talk about them. They can be books that you read a long time ago, books that you recently read, books that you want to read, uh, books that you never want to read, whatever. Uh, it's all about just kind of casually talking about 10 books. Uh, so we're going to run down uh, really quick here. First up, uh, a book that is kind of like grab and gab sort of book. Uh, this is the very first book I read in 2017. Uh, we we have Breakfast at Tiffany's by Truman Capote, okay? Uh, I sat down on, on New Year's Day uh, in a little cafe near near the University of Washington, and I had a little moment. Uh, you know, this is a short little thing. Uh, and Breakfast, uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's is fine. Uh, I'm not a big Capote fan. Um, I think I had recently rewatched the movie. And uh, the movie is better than the book, uh, but I think both are, are pretty overrated. Um, the film, I think, um, is better, not necessarily because of Audrey Hepburn, but to me at least, uh, because of the film score. The Henry Mancini score, uh, still to this day, is one of the greatest film scores of all time. Um, but, you know, it's, it's whatever. It's Breakfast at Tiffany's. Oh, on an unrelated um, public service announcement, okay? Unless you are between the ages of 18 and 22 and also live in a sorority, do not, and I repeat, do not hang a picture of Audrey Hepburn anywhere in your home. Uh, and that also goes for pictures of Marilyn Monroe, and it also goes for Chanel quotes, okay? If you have any of those up, just go take them down right now and burn them. Just burn them, okay? <laughs> and while we're already on Truman Capote, I thought I would mention another one of his books, which is honestly one of the worst books I have ever read, uh, which is his debut novel, Other Voices, Other Rooms. And, um, you know, a lot of people consider this like a classic of LGBT Southern Gothic fiction. Uh, but man, I think it's so horrible. And a really good example of someone desperately trying to tap into their southern roots and failing miserably. Their Voices in Other Rooms is most well known not only for being Capote's uh, debut novel, uh, but also because of his friendship with Harper Lee, right? They were good friends growing up, and they both... Um, they both based a character on each other within their own respective novels. Uh, I think in To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, the character was Dill, um, and I forget who it was in Other Voices, Other Rooms, uh, that was based on Lee, but um, yeah, it's ridiculous, you know, stacking the two novels against each other, um, it, it's ridiculous. And, and I say this as someone, I'm, you know, To Kill a Mockingbird, I'm, I'm pretty, you know, indifferent about it, it it's fine. Um, but <laughs> putting the two together, it's like, have you ever seen like two siblings and one of the siblings is like super good looking and they're like the star athlete of the family. And then the other sibling is, uh, you know, kind of off looking and, and not. <laughs> uh, that's what it's like stacking those two books up together. You can tell they're kind of related, uh, but 
they're not. Uh, this is definitely like the basement baby of, of the two. Uh, and while we're on the topic of, of Southern lit, I thought I would, uh, of course, mention someone who does it very well, uh, which is William Faulkner. And uh, for those keeping score at home, I'm still continuing on with What the Fuck, my project to read all 19 uh, William Faulkner novels uh, within the year. Uh, I'm honestly, I'm not going to finish them all within a year. I still have seven out of the 19 left. Uh, and I'm not going to rush in these last two months to finish them, but I, of course, I'm going to continue and, and sometime early in the new year, I'll complete it. But one of the books uh, that I, I don't think I ever mentioned, uh, uh, one of his huge works, of course, uh, is Light in August. Um, I think it's his fifth or sixth novel. And um, Light in August is, is so fantastic and kind of holds its place as, as one of his classics. And it's a book... Um, you know, I, even though I still have seven more uh, of his works to read, I feel confident in saying that uh, if you're someone who is new to Faulkner and you're looking for an entryway into his, his body of work, uh, I think Light in August is the best choice. Um, even though it, it's one of his longest works, I think it's also uh, maybe his most uh, accessible. It's, um, it's pretty linear in, in, in the way it's set out. Um, both its style and structure is, is not quite as experimental as some of his other works. Um, it's a pretty simple read, and it has a lot of compelling characters, a lot of compelling issues. Uh, it even has kind of an undercurrent of, of, uh, of a thriller and a mystery. Uh, so yeah, I think it's a great, great entryway if you're looking to start with Faulkner and you don't know where to go. Uh, but yeah, Light in August it was fantastic. I actually read this while I was over in Thailand. Um, and you wouldn't think it would be a good fit for <laughs> traveling abroad, but it, it was. Uh, and while we're on the topic of, of Faulkner, I thought I would uh, go ahead and mention uh, another person that I mentioned quite a bit on this channel, which is Cormac McCarthy. Uh, this is an early novel of his called Outer Dark. It's his second novel. And I, I mentioned this, you know, of course, last year was Project McCarthy, as I read all 10 of McCarthy's books in, in chronological order. And it, it's been really interesting, of course, reading... McCarthy back to back with a year of Faulkner. Um, McCarthy was heavily inspired by Faulkner. Many consider him kind of the modern day Faulkner. It's interesting not only seeing what McCarthy took from Faulkner, uh, but maybe even more so seeing what he didn't, okay? And uh, there's a lot of differences between the two men, but uh, one of the, the kind of surface level one that, that's very noticeable is the presence of women. Um, and I say this, listen, Cormac McCarthy is my favorite living author. I, I love him a lot, but he cannot write women, um, okay? He, he just can't. And for that reason, uh, you, you'll notice that they're pretty much absent through the, you know, the majority of his work. Um, and, and not to say, you know, William Faulkner was by no means, a fa you know, a really f fantastic writer of women, uh, but almost any you know any of your your average faulkner novels will probably have more um more female representation than all 10 of mccarthy's novels combined uh so yeah it, it's pretty blatant um but i wanted to mention outer dark because it is um it's not one of his his best novels it's, you know it's one of his early works but it's it's the only novel of his that does have one of its main protagonists um as a woman um, and it's about, um, and I, again, he doesn't write her that well, but it, it's about a, a brother and sister who have an incestuous relationship and they have a baby together and the brother ends up taking the baby and abandoning it in um, the forest or in the middle of the woods. Uh, and the story is kind of about the two paths of, the, of this brother and sister uh, as, she, as she searches for the baby and, and he searches for her. Um, it's, it, it's kind of trashy, um, but it, it's decent, especially kind of as one of his early Southern Gothic novels. Um, but yeah, it's interesting to seeing him, you know, the only novel in which he really does, um, you know, focus on, on a female character, uh, even if he doesn't do it uh, that, uh, you know, well. So yeah, Outer Dark. Uh, next up, I, I briefly wanted to mention um, the, the kind of the Cormac McCarthy of my childhood. Uh, this is Conrad Richter's The Light in the Forest, okay? Um, and, and this is a book I read over and over when I was like 11 or 12 years old. It is, um, it's the story of, um, 
uh, a, a white uh, white kid um, who, as an infant, is abducted by by a Native American tribe, and he's raised as as one of them. Um, and then when he's like eleven years old, he is um, this Indian tribe strikes a deal with the the white settlers, uh, and they give back this boy back to the, his you know biological white family. Um, and he is forced to leave the tribe, and he does not assimilate well into this this you know group of white people. Um, and yeah, man, I recently read this, and I can't believe that you know this is considered I don't know middle grade or young adult, uh, and it's something that could never be published today. Uh, not only because of its kind of the way it portrays um, Native Americans, but also just the violence. I mean, there's this kid tries to commit suicide. He ends up escaping, uh, running away from this white community. Uh, but in the process, he kills his uncle, his white uncle, and he half scalps him. Okay. <laughs> like, and I'm sitting there, you know, on my Where's Waldo bedspread, sipping a Capri Sun, just lapping this up. I loved it. Um, and yeah, he escapes the tribe. He, he then runs back to the Indian tribe, but then he discovers that they have been scalping white babies or, or children. So he's like, I can't be a part of this either. So the end of the book, spoiler alert, he just goes off on his own. He's just, he doesn't have the white family, he doesn't have the Indians, he's just on his own. It's it's very intense for for a children's novel. And yeah, I actually picked up The Light in the Forest recently and reread it uh, just to kind of prep myself because I, I've been wanting to read uh, Conrad Richter's trilogy, uh, which is called the Awakening Land Trilogy. It includes the book uh, The Trees, The Fields, and The Town. Um, and uh, this is meant for, I think, an older audience. And it's, um, it's the story about a pioneering... Um, family in the Ohio Valley. Uh, and yeah, I don't know. I've been in the mood for, for a good, like, American pioneer story. Um, and of course, I, I've been wanting to revisit Conrad Richter since I was a kid. Um, so yeah, I got my Capri Suns lined up, uh, ready for the Awakening Land trilogy. So I'm going to count this as, as one book, okay? Uh, and talking about being in the mood for a certain type of book, uh, I recently was in the mood. I just wanted a good modern suburban American drama. Okay, that's completely my bag. I love that. Uh, so I was attracted to uh, <laughs> Little Fires Everywhere by Celeste Eng, and I, I read it last month, and it was just w one of the worst books I've read all year for sure. I thought it was so bad, and it's one of those books I I see review after review of people just really loving it, and I feel like I'm taking crazy pills um, because Man, it was so bad. The characters were so weak. Everyone was linked together through these coincidences that made no sense. Uh, it was just so poorly constructed. Uh, it was mind boggling. Um, and it's the type of book, you know, I, I kind of joked on the Twitter about this. It happened to also be a pick for uh, Reese Witherspoon, I guess, has a book club. Um, and, uh, you know, Witherspoon is fine. I like Cruel Intentions as you know as much as the the next asshole, but um, it, it the book did very much feel like what I imagine a Reese Witherspoon book club would be like. Uh, it's the type of deal where you know you can meet up with the book club and you all sit down and you have like chocolate croissants and you can all kind of pretend to dive into these issues that the book talks about in terms of motherhood and, and women's rights and mother's rights and race and class issues and all that. Um, but you never really have to dig too deep because Celeste Ng never digs too deep. It's, it's a very kind of simple work. Um, and I didn't think it was, it was smart at all. I didn't like it. So yeah, that was a dud. Next up, a, a very short little thing. This is On Tyranny by Timothy Snyder. Uh, Timothy Snyder is a historian and an intellect. Uh, I, I really like him. Uh, this was fine. This was something uh, that came out uh, at the beginning of the year, and you can tell it was something that was rushed out in response to the 2016, you know, U.S. elections. It's uh, 20 lessons from the 20th century, connecting tyranny of, of the past to the present, obviously. Um, it's fine, you know, obviously, T Timothy Snyder's area of expertise is Nazi Germany and to a lesser extent the Soviet Union. 
So almost all of the 20 lessons from this within the 20th century are from that. Um, and, and that's why it feels very rushed uh, because there's, there's very few examples of, of anything, you know, from China or Japan or North Korea. Um, there's a bit about the U.S., um, but, but there's a lot of other areas of tyranny. Obviously, I understand, you know, World War II and, and Nazi Germany is, is kind of, you know, the main event uh, when we talk about tyranny in the 20th century. But um, yeah, it just, it felt like stuff that's all been explored in his previous books um, in much more depth. Uh, so this felt like something just kind of cobbled together uh, to make a profit off off the results of the election. Uh, I think I saw uh, Kathleen Ann, she talked about how this would make like a good gift for like a graduate uh, and totally for that. You know, it's a little manifesto, but to the audience that's going to read it, it's, it's really nothing new, these lessons. Um, and the audience that, that it would be news to uh, doesn't read. So it's like, I don't, I don't quite get who the audience for this is, um, but it's fine. I, I mainly wanted to mention it um, to recommend Timothy Snyder's um, huge work, not, not tiny at all, uh, on the Holocaust, um, which again is his, his kind of area of expertise, uh, but it's called Black Earth, uh, and it's called The Holocaust as a History and Warning, again, connecting to this. Uh, but it's a huge expanse of work, and it's it's so, so good. Uh, but the book is, is a real success, in my opinion, because it avoids the, the kind of the Achilles heel of Holocaust, uh, you know, documentaries and, and studies and, and, and works of, of nonfiction, uh, because it doesn't spend too much time in the concentration camps. Uh, Snyder goes into the book assuming that the average reader picking it up knows the majority of, of, of what went on there. Um, and it's tough because certainly it's important that, that we all know the details of, of what happened within the concentration camps. But when, you know, we, we as a culture, we have this morbid fascination with it. And when you kind of get stuck in there and, and going through all those kind of horrific details, it often can muddle all the stuff outside of the concentration camps, um, and especially all those building blocks that occurred that allowed to, you know, the concentration camps to even exist in the first place. Um, so it, it's an expansive study that doesn't get bogged down um, with details of the concentration camp. And for that reason, I really recommend it. And I think it stands apart from a lot of other Holocaust studies. Uh, so there you go. From Audrey Hepburn to the Holocaust, you have it all covered uh, with the casual 10. Uh, as for who I'm going to tag, I'm going to tag, as Steve did, I'm, I'm going to tag Sean in his own tag with a new fresh name. Um, also, Steve, please do it. Uh, please get casual. You can put on a little hat and get a cup of coffee. Uh, you know, you don't need to frantically run around your room. Uh, a nice steady cam would be nice for the casual 10 tag. And um, yeah, anybody else who would do this. I, I always like hearing people just kind of talk about random books. Uh, so that's it. I hope you're all well. I'll talk to you soon. Mm -hmm.